Hello students, welcome to the EPG Patashala. I am Professor Gauri Nath from School of Life Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Today I am going to talk about module on structural levels of proteins and their stabilizing forces from biomolecules and their interactions. So the objectives of this module is to learn the organization of protein structure like uh, primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure and quaternary structures and what are the forces that stabilize the protein structure. So in the primary structure we all know it is arrangement of amino acids in linear form but don't forget the disulfide bridges are also part of the primary structure. In the secondary structures we will learn uh, details about the alpha helix and beta sheet, what kind of hydrogen bonds are formed. Tertiary structure we all know that all the secondary structures come together and arrange themselves in a, to form a tertiary structures. These tertiary structures arrange themselves to give a quaternary structures. The quaternary structures should can be a same polypeptide or a different polypeptides will form a quaternary structure. And there are different forces that stabilize the protein structure like hydrogen bond, Van der Waals interaction, electrostatic interactions. All these forces stabilize the protein structure. In this, we will all discuss what are the forces which actually stabilize the protein structure, which is the dominant force in the protein structures, and how these structural uh, energy component of these uh, forces can be calculated to give a total energy of the protein structure. Now, these different energy potentials in the protein structure which give which you can calculate the total energy of protein structure and what are the uses and where we use this term. Proteins are made up of amino acids. Amino acids are covalently connected by peptide bonds and make protein. In general, there are about 20 amino acids which are naturally occurring and very dominantly occurring. Proline is one of the amino acid. We call it as amino acid, but actually it's an amino acid. Other than uh, these 20 amino acids, there are many forms of amino acids. They are modified. Um, they exist in naturally, but very rarely. So amino acid, as the name says, it has one amino group, one carboxy group, and a side chain. Primary structure. Primary structure is basically the arrangement of amino acids, how they are connected to form a protein. Basically, it tells about all the covalent bonds formed between the amino acids. So when I say covalent bonds, it also explains the disulfide bridges, which are the cysteines are forming disulfide bridges. It shows the amino acids, when they are connected, the peptide bonds are formed. The peptide bonds are planar in nature because the two electrons from nitrogen and carbonyl group where the electrons can exchange and the CN bond becomes a planar in nature. And whereas the two other single bonds, the NC and CO are single bonds where the conformation of the amino acids can change and can lead to different structures. Secondary structures. The secondary structures are well-ordered local structures. Uh, these arise due to non-covalent interactions and where the covalent interactions do not play any role in this. The hydrogen bond interactions of the backbone NH and carbonyl groups define the secondary structures. So the hydrogen bond with, with the NH and, and the CO which define these secondary structures. The each secondary structures adopt a, a similar kind of phi psi angles for the backbone irrespective of their side chains. Like examples, all the alpha helices will have a similar phi psi angles and all the beta sheets have a similar phi psi angles. Now the first time these secondary structures were uh, described by Linus Pauling and Robert Corley uh, who first described the alpha helix and he almost said that the problem of protein structure is solved. But later, after few years, he again proposed the model of beta sheets. At that time, there were no protein structures were discovered or determined by any method. Alpha helix. Alpha helix is a right-handed helix where 
hydrogen bond is formed between first and fourth amino acids or n n plus 4 amino acids in a right handed alpha helix there are 3.6 residues per turn and each turn it the helix raises by 5.4 angstroms and the distance between the two residues is 1.5 angstroms the generally the phi psi angle for alpha helices is minus 57 and minus 47 we could also say uh, 60 minus 60 minus 50 in the alpha helix all the carbonyl groups are in one direction and all the amino uh, NH groups are in the other direction. Because of this, the helix will have a dipole formation. Alpha helix. There are several residues which prefers to form alpha helix like glutamic acid, alanine, histidine, leucine and methanine will prefer to form alpha helix and they generally exist in alpha helix. There are many residues which are also alpha helix breakers um, specifically the cluster of beta branch residues as uh, example isoleucine threonine and valine hinder the helix formation and if you have a glycine in between also uh, break the helical structures the membrane spawning helix helices generally have only hydrophobic amino acids alpha helices are not exactly cylindrical all the time Suppose if a proline residue come in the middle of the alpha helix, because the proline doesn't have an NH group, it cannot form a backbone hydrogen bond, it will cause a distortion. Similarly, if the glycine comes in the middle of alpha helix, because glycine doesn't have any side chain and is very flexible, can also distort the alpha helical conformation. And major factor is Helices, when they are exposed out to the solvent, and most of the globular protein, where the helical alpha helices are exposed to the uh, solvent, the alpha helix bent to form a curve, curved structure so that it can interact with more water and form hydrogen bonds, and due to which you have a, a curved uh, alpha helical structures. Alpha helix can be represented as a spiral wheel model uh, where we all know that alpha helix there are 3.6 residues per turn. That means for each turn they are about 300 degrees. So 3.6 residues and 360 degrees per turn that is about 100 degrees, 100 degrees rotation per each residue along the helical axis. If you look at the spiral wheel, uh, each atom you can each amino acid you can draw along the spiral wheel as shown in the slide so if you draw the amino acid sequence in a linear form uh, in the spiral wheel form and you can identify uh, where this helix can exist in the protein structure as example i have seen i have shown you in the spiral wheel where the charged residues are polar residues like asparagine aspartic acid, glutamic acid and arginine are all coming one side of the spiral wheel whereas all the hydrophobic residues like isoleucine, phenylalanine, leucine are coming one side of the spiral wheel that clearly describes that these charged residues are exposed to the solvent whereas a polar residues are uh, ex inside the core of the protein or forms the core of the protein. So, while looking at the whole primary sequence, you may not be able to identify what kind of helix this will form. But once you put the amino acids in the spiral wheel, then you can be able to guess where this alpha helix could be forming. So this will give a lot of information. Uh, once you represent the amino acids in a spiral wheel form, you can easily identify where this helix can form, whether it is uh, in the core of the protein or it is a transmembrane helix or the helix in the surface of the protein structure. Beta sheets. Beta sheets are also called as extended structures. Uh, beta sheet generally by itself does not exist. They two or more polypeptide chain run along side by side and the hydrogens form bonds are formed between the two chains. There are 3.5 angstrom residues between the residue 
and in the beta sheet the two consecutive side chains are opposite to each other and similarly two carbonyl group groups are opposite to each other so the carbonyl group and side chain of the same amino acids are perpendicular to each other the beta sheets as i said you need two or more uh, sheets to form a beta sheets so these sheets could be a parallel or anti parallel if they are anti parallel the hydrogen bonds are more straight and the distance between the two sheets become uh, smaller and they are more stable compared to parallel beta sheets in many structures you also have mixed beta sheets where the combination of parallel and anti parallel beta sheets the beta sheets as i said we may say are the parallel anti parallel beta sheets but they are not exactly like railway tracks they are always twisted by 25 to 30 degrees so you always find a left handed a beta sheet twist in the protein structures in this slide i have shown you example of thyroid axin where in the center we can clearly see the beta sheets are twisted and these beta sheets are connected by alpha helices tertiary structure tertiary structure arises due to interaction of side chains between the secondary structures each individual residue in tertiary structure exists in a most stable conformation unless until very functionally uh, required uh, residues generally all the hydrophobic residues are uh, in the interior and all the charged residues are on the surface now one of the example of globular domain uh, tertiary structure is shown here is a myoglobin in tertiary structure almost all hydrogen bond acceptors donors are generally satisfied uh, if they cannot form hydrogen bond within itself within the protein they interact with the water globular proteins are tightly packed and in the center um, they are as tightly packed as a solid material but as you move from the center to the surface they are loosely packed near the surface the low packing density indicates flexibility and movement and the functional role of those that region quaternary structures different polypeptides or different tertiary structures or subunits come together to form a quaternary structure now these domains could be a single polypeptide or different polypeptides the subunits can be a similar type or different type the similar type of subunit ones we call as the homotropic quaternary structures and if you are different kinds of subunits we call them as a heterotropic quaternary structures these quaternary structures generally have internal symmetry example is a hemoglobin but here in the example i have shown you lactate dehydrogenase which is a heterotropic uh, quaternary structure another example of quaternary structure is aspartate transcarbamylase the aspartic transcarbamylase is very complex structure where you have six catalytic units and six regulatory units the catalytic units form uh, trimers and regulatory units form dimer and the regulatory units come and interact between the two trimers now the quaternary structures have cooperativity in substrate binding so when cooperativity means so because you have multiple catalytic subunits so if one binds to one substrate binds to one catalytic unit subunit the, it enhances the active conformation of the secondary um, catalytic site so that's how it's we call it as a cooperative substrate binding and most of the uh, quaternary structures have allosteric regulation so they can have activators and they have a suppressors so the regulatory subunits what we have where either activators or regulators or suppressors can bind to regulatory subunit can enhance the conformation uh, to increase the activity or it also can um, change the conformation so that the activity is reduced so that's why we have we call them as activators or suppressors which bind to regulatory subunits the quaternary structures have um, several advantages like they have less surface to volume ratio to do a better function and they also um, have a genetic economy and efficiency so if you 
these kind of uh, quaternary sub, uh, subunit containing enzymes are involved, involved in a um, biological functions or pathways where you don't want to generate the product constantly. If the final product is synthesized, it should come back, bind to regulatory subunit and inhibit uh, the activity so that it synthesizes the less product. The stabilizing forces in the protein structures. We studied um, the ones which form the other than peptide bonds. We have disulfide bonds, which connects the cysteine-cysteine residues. These uh, disulfide bridges are generally uh, long range interactions. They are not neighboring residues which interact with each other. In the primary sequence, they could be from far away. Uh, physiologically, uh, in our body, it's a reduced environment. So generally, SS bonds are reduced, but uh, where they are exposed to uh, oxygen are um, other places where SS bonds are formed. There are a number of ways SS bond from can form. And this is a very um, important question. If you have, let's say, eight cysteines in a, a protein, so it can form 7 into 5 into 3 into 1. That is 105 conformations. So if you have a more number of uh, cysteines, so basically you, uh, you multiply. If you have n cysteines, you multiply n minus 1, n minus 3, n minus 5, and so on, so on, so on. That will give a number of possible ways thus a disulfide bridge can be formed. Disulfide bonds in protein folding. So the question is, is the disulfide bridges are very important for protein folding or protein stability? We can do a simple experiment and discuss this. Like example, ribonuclease. It has a eight cysteines. So you can denature the ribonuclease with eight molar urea and DTT. So 8 molar urea will denature all the secondary structures, all the uh, molecular interactions, and DTT will reduce their uh, disulfide bridges. So we can refold ribonuclease in two different ways. One, first remove DTT, so you allow the disulfide bridges to form, and second, you remove the urea first, so where you allow it to fold. So where you remove the DTT first and urea later, that means you first allow the disulfide bridges to form and the protein to fold. Then when you do this kind of experiment, you only get 1% of the activity back. If you do other way, first you remove the urea, that means you allow the protein to fold first and remove DTT and then you, that means you allow the disulfide bridges to form after the protein is folded. Then you get 99% of the activity retained. So what does it imply? So, if you allow the disulfide bridges to form first, you get only 1% of activity. If you allow the disulfide bridges to form after the protein is folded, you almost get 100% activity. That clearly indicates SS bond is not important in protein folding, maybe in the stability. Now, another question I would like to ask is, why only 1% of activity is retained when you allow the DT to form? Um, disulfide bridges to form first, as we discussed before, this ribonuclease has 8 cysteines. 8 cysteines means it can form 105 conformations. So out of 105 conformations, only one conformation is active. So 1 out of 105 is approximately 1%. And that's how you have only 1% of activity when you allow the disulfide bridges to form first, but when you allow the protein to form fold first, the cysteines come in exact position where the protein is in active form. So disulfide bonds, we said, are not important in protein folding. Can we apply the same for the insulin? Can we do same experiment with in insulin where you denature and refold with insulin? You won't get active insulin in any way. Because insulin has two chains, it's not of single chain. But you can do the same experiment with pre-pro insulin and it can fold back similar to ribonuclease. But whereas if you do the same experiment with in mature insulin, 
it cannot be folded back because disulfide bridges are between the two polypeptides. Non-covalent interactions. All these protein structures are stabilized basically by uh, several non-covalent interactions. The electrostatic interactions, hydrogen bonds, metallic bonds, hydrophobic interactions are major dominant non-covalent interactions. Like electrostatic interaction is where positive charge residue interacts with the negative charge residue. I will describe further details in the uh, next slides, but example, the arginine a positive charge residue interacts with the glutamic acid or aspartic acid or negative charge residue to form as salt bridges or basically the ones which we can call them as electrostatic interactions. Hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are the hydrogen is involved, uh, hydrogen is connected to an uh, electronegative atom and which attracts or uh, interacts with another electronegative atom where uh, lone pair of electrons from the other atom it attracts. And these uh, for details of hydrogen bonds are again described, uh, discussed in the next slide. The metallic bonds, several proteins which are actually stabilized by several metallic clusters which give uh, stable structures. Um, the more dominant forces in the protein structure is hydrophobic interactions where many um, atoms which do not have charge, hydrophobic by themselves describe that water repelling properties or water uh, phobic properties. So these examples in all the protein atoms we have carbon and carbon they which do not have any charge like nitrogen and oxygen they try to come together and these are also is described as van der Waals interactions. I will describe all these interactions in more detail in coming slides. Electrostatic interactions. Electrostatic interactions are also called as salt bridges. In proteins, they are formed between the carboxyl group of aspartic acid or glutamic acid with guanidium group of arginine or uh, amino group of lysine. So electrostatic interactions, they form follow a similar electrostatic interaction which you studied in the school, they follow Coulomb's law. So basically the energy is directly proportional to Q1, Q2 divided by R. So it's basically the product of the charges divided by the distance between these charges. Electrostatic interactions are the salt bridges between the in the protein structure are about 2.8 angstroms. The energy contribution due to um, electrostatic interactions in the water is about 12 to 17 kilojoules per mole, whereas in the hydrophobic environment, um, its contribution is about 30 kilojoules per mole. That means in the hydrophobic environment, their um, role is much larger. So in the water, the strength is less because water also can form uh, interact ionic interactions. So therefore, uh, the, hydro the salt bridges are more stronger in the core of the protein uh, where they are in the hydrophobic environment, but on the surface, their contribution to the protein structure is less. Hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonds are weak electrostatic interactions, but they have a directional property. So the direction of hydrogen from one electronegative atom should be in the same plane as the next electronegative atom, the two electrons are there. If they are in the same plane, the strength is larger. As it becomes perpendicular, the strength becomes very weak. So in proteins, generally, we have hydrogen bonds between N, H, and O. The hydrogen bond distance is about 2.7 to 3.5 angstroms. It's generally about 3 angstroms. The energy contribution of hydrogen bond in water is about 2 to 6 kilojoules per mole, whereas if they are buried in the hydrophobic environment, they are 12 to 30 kilojoules per mole. So similar to ionic interactions, because the hydrogen bond can also form with water, the strength becomes very less. But in the hydrophobic environment, it cannot interact with anything else. And the energy between the, because of the hydrophobic hydrogen bond in the hydrophobic environment becomes stronger. As we are discussing about the importance of each non-covalent interactions, so we will make a hypothesis that the hydrogen bonds are important for structural stability. So we can design an experiment or look into the data available and we can discuss whether this 
intera these interactions the hydrogen bond is important for structural stability like example in favor of hydrogen bond as an important force in the structural stability like melting point and boiling point of water is high as good as a hydrogen bond and protein denature as the temperature increases that means what as the temperature increases you are breaking the hydrogen bonds and you are denaturing the protein that clearly says that hydrogen bonds are important for the protein structure and similarly the proteins have an internal architecture like helices and, and beta sheets if the hydrogen bonds were not so important then we would not expect alpha helices and beta sheets in the protein structure now these are the points which will help uh, support the hypothesis that hydrogen bonds are important for the structural stability but we can also argue the other way now i'll tell you the few points here like example if the hydrogen bonds are important then they could interact uh, with polyethylene glycol glycerol which are actually uh, hydrogen bond forming re uh, reagents so instead of making hydrogen bonds within the protein they could actually do hydrogen bond with polyethylene glycol or glycerol but actually instead of these agents peg and glycerol denaturing the protein they actually stabilize the protein now again uh, the same argument you can uh, for extend it if the hydrogen bonds are very important in the protein structure then protein should have a similar kind of structure irrespective of side chains so even the different side chains they should have a similar structure like alpha helix and beta sheets but all the proteins do not have a similar kind of structure now we can take another example is a very uh, important example is n methyl acetamide n methyl acetamide is the smallest uh, peptide mimicking reagent which is very similar to amino acid backbone now if you take this uh, molecule in a uh, water a uh, chloroform and a uh, dmso so in the chloroform at very low concentrations it forms a dimer but if you take it to um, dmso it needs little more higher concentration and if you take it to water it needs almost 10 molar to form dimers so what does it explain it explains that the hydrophobic environment in chloroform this is nma n methyl acetamide forms a dimer so that clearly says that the n acetyl uh, acetamide is not, not forming hydrogen bonds when it can form hydrogen bond with water it only forming hydrogen bond when there is a hydrophobic environment the importance of hydrogen bond in the structural stability we can discuss so if you make a hypothesis that hydrogen bonds are important in the structural stability so if the hydrogen bond is dominant force the all the proteins should have a similar structure independent of the amino acids but that is not correct uh, generally the proteins the carbonyl groups form 9% beta sheet or 25% alpha helix 5% turns 19% loops and irregular remaining interact with water so that means the hydrogen bonds are not so dominant hydrophobic interactions the interaction between the non polar atoms basically as we say hydrophobic the water repelling property so they rip, repel water and interact with each other something like example micelle formation of oils or lipids to reduce the surface area and have a less contact with water soluble globular proteins hide hydrophobic core residues uh, in the core as similar to micelle formation now how does the energy contribution due to hydrophobic interactions suppose if you have two um, atoms uh, far away there is no um, interaction between them of course there is no interaction between them there is no force between them but these two atoms starts uh, coming close to each other the nucleus of one atom starts to interact with the electron cloud of the other atom and the similarly the the electron cloud of one atom interacts with the nucleus of the other atom but as they come together the energy the interaction energy between them becomes increased but when they come uh, closer 
the electron cloud electron cloud and nucleus and nucleus repel much more robustly and they repel from there the attractive and repulsive forces are described by linear zone potential and um, here where you have attractive forces and the repel our lowest is basically what we call as a um, distance the minimum least energy uh, minimum most uh, distance needed but where the uh, attractive forces and repulsive forces are equal and they don't change uh, contribute any energy is actually we call a van der Waals distance and as the two atoms come much closer the repulsion energy becomes very high as shown in the curve importance of hydrophobic interaction in structural stability similarly you can have a hypothesis how important are these hydrophobic interactions so you can uh, do set of experiments in supporting or disproving the importance of hydrophobic interactions so example uh, the organic solvent denature the protein so that means they disturb the hydrophobic interactions and they denature the protein so that indicates that hydrophobic interactions are important and the, similarly the ionic strength and um, hydrogen bond strength increases as um, when we add uh, organic solvents but the protein still denature the another point is the proteins have hydrophobic residues in the core and that clearly says the importance of the hydrophobic residues but to disprove this you can always say then if the hydrophobic interactions are so stable why should they have internal architecture another way you can always say as the temperature increases the hydrophobic interactions become stronger but in the case of proteins as the temperature increases the protein denature so you can also have a counter uh, arguments for the hypothesis of importance of hydrophobic interactions so as i said every point we have um, discussed have a uh, positive points and the negative points but the protein structure is actually the combination of all interactions which make it a um, stable structure dear students so this will be the summary of this module now we learn uh, different interactions non covalent interactions how they are stabilized now each non covalent interactions we also discussed about the how do you calculate energy of each uh, contribution of each non covalent interaction here i am listing out how do we calculate the energy of total protein structure like if you have a total protein structure you could have a bonded interactions and non bonded interactions non bonded interactions we have discussed throughout the chapter last few slides the bonded ones are also play role like bond length bond angle a dihedral angle now the bond length is not always common uh, constant in protein structures so when we say carbon carbon distance is 1.54 angstroms it's not exactly 1.54 angstroms all the time 1.54 is the lowest energy state but at room temperature which is not which has some energy and like biological temperature which we are at 37 degrees it still have energy so the bonds can fluctuate and similarly the bond angle the bond angle also can have um like sp3 hybridization if you have um, 104 degrees approximately but it's not necessary that it has to be always that angle and the dihedral angle and dihedral angle you all know that cis and trans conformation also cause um, energy um, difference so the all these bonded interactions also contribute to the total energy of the protein the non bonded interactions as we discussed before the electrostatic interactions van der waals interactions and hydrogen bonds where the energy terms are described before now all these terms together will give you the total energy of the protein structure now where do we use this total energy of the protein structure now this is a uh, basically we use this uh, to minimization of the protein structure uh, when we do dynamics of the protein structure or when we refine the structure of nmr and crystal structures now let me remind you that energy of the protein structure is a relative term it only tells from one play, one starting point to the end, end point whether you are going 
in a low energy state or higher energy state but it does not tell you whether this is the lowest energy level like example you can also use this energy um, calculations for binding of um, you know inhibitors or ligands or protein protein interactions if a, a small compound if binds to your protein active site or uh, on the surface somewhere and that can reduce the energy of your protein structure so that if it, the energy is reduced that is a favorable interaction and if the energy is not reduced if it is goes up it is unfavorable interactions so this can be also used in your in silico drug screening methods and thank you